Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to present a prospective randomized trial that compares the short-term to a long-term antibiotic treatment after percutaneous nephrolithotomy for infection stones. Uh, those stroke stones only make up for 15% of all kidney stones. Their mortality is disproportionate if left untreated. The key points in the treatment of infection stones are a complete surgical stone removal and antibiotic therapy aiming to maintain sterile urine after the cessation of antibiotic treatment. We face a lack in high quality data concerning the antibiotic treatment. To date, no prospective study has been performed to compare a short-term versus a long-term antibiotic prophylaxis for infection stone patients. Current recommendations are based on historic and retrospective reports. The Canadian guidelines recommend a low-dose antibiotic therapy without any statement on the duration. The American guidelines recommend long-term prophylactic therapy and the European guidelines either short or long-term antibiotic therapy. We hypothesized that two weeks of post-operative antibiotics would be sufficient to reduce the amount of stone recurrence and bladder infection at six months. And we further hypothesized that three months of post-operative antibiotics may provide even more reduced stone recurrence or bladder infection at six months. However, um, after a certain period of time on antibiotic therapy, the protective effect of additional antibiotic therapy might diminish. The objective was to determine which duration of antibiotic therapy, two weeks or three months, is better at minimizing the recurrence of stone infection uh, formation and following definite surgical therapy. At this prospective randomized trial enrolled patients at least 18 years of age with a high suspicion of infection stones and scheduled for PNL in four centers across Canada and the United States. Those patients not able to undergo surgery or take antibiotics or unable to provide consent were excluded. After PNL, patients were randomized to two weeks or three months of antibiotics, and antibiotics were um, administered culture specific. If no culture was obtained, um, patients were given a calculated antibiotic therapy. CT was performed one day after surgery to assess stone free rates. And those patients with fragments larger than four, meters, four millimeters were not included. Um, after that, patients presented at three, six, and 12 months for follow-up, including urine cultures and imaging. Primary outcome was the stone-free rate at six months uh, following PNL, and secondary outcomes were stone-free rate over 12 months, positive urine cultures at any point within one year, antibiotic-related com complications such as Clostridium difficile colitis, in-hospital sepsis or febrile episodes, readmission for sepsis and renal colic or repeat surgical procedure for stone recurrence. According to sample size calculations, um, 11 patients were necessary to detect a reduction of stone formation by 50% with a power of 80%. Between 2016 and 2021, 38 patients were assessed for eligibility and randomized. Three patients were lost to follow up and 11 patients were excluded due to residual fragments larger than four millimeters. And we have 12 patients in the group that received two weeks of antibiotics and 11 patients who received three months of antibiotics. This table shows the patient's characteristics. Patients' age, gender, and BMI were comparable. A majority had a previous um, urine, a history of previous urinary tract infection, um, and the ASA score indicates that about 60% have severe systemic disease. And this table shows stone characteristics. Patients from both groups um, had a significant stone burden. Struvid stones were documented in 50 and 25% as the primary component. And we found positive stone cultures in the majority of patients. The operation time was comparable between the groups and we encountered sepsis in one patient from each group. The primary outcome was the stone free rate after six months. The graph on the right shows the number of patients who are stone free and during follow up in the two treatment arms. The rates did not differ depending on the duration of treatment. 
Secondary outcome was the stone free rate over one year, positive urine cultures at any point during follow up interventions after PNL, and readmission due to fever or sepsis. Those rates did not differ either. Also, no Clostridium difficile colitis infection was recorded. Uh, the study has limitations. The recruitment, recruitment was very challenging. And although we recruited at four centers, uh, the sample size is small and the follow-up is incomplete. Um, urine cultures were analyzed during follow-up, though bacterial resistances were not recorded. However, uh, we believe that this study provides valuable data. It is the first prospective study on the duration of antibiotic treatment after PCNL for infection stones. We conclude that short-term um, antibiotic treatment after PNL for infection stones shows similar stone-free rates and positive urine culture rates post-PNL compared to a long-term treatment. And we further conclude that short-term antibiotic treatment may potentially decrease antibiotic resistances and related antibiotic therapy complications compared to a long-term treatment. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I'm Drew. I'm one of the uh, R4 urology residents here at UBC. And uh, so, yeah, I'll be talking about uh, prostate MRI and the use of multidisciplinary rounds uh, for adding benefit to, uh, to patients. Uh, no disclosures. Um, so uh, inter-observer variability uh, in multiparametric MRI has been... Um, uh, widely investigated in other other forms of uh, of medicine, uh, and prior studies have examined the performance in community centers, but there's no uh, real direct comparison between community and tertiary uh, referral centers um, at this point. So um, uh, the studies that have been done on subspecialty second reads and other disciplines have found clinically relevant discrepancies. So we thought that maybe this was a good opportunity to investigate for uh, whether there was a difference in prostate uh, MRI. Um, we analyzed 303 consecutive cases, which were collected retrospectively from January of 2017 to August 2020 at a single tertiary care center here at VGH. Uh, the patients uh, who were investigated were either those with suspected prostate cancer on, or on active surveillance, and they were referred for a truss ultrasound-guided MRI fusion biopsy of the prostate uh, based on the community reads um, of the, the prostate MRIs. So they were uh, got their imaging in an offsite and then were referred for fusion biopsy uh, if that uh, were amenable. Uh, at the multidisciplinary rounds, the uh, images were reviewed by abdominal radiologists uh, trained in, in prostate MRI as well as urologic oncologists, abdominal radiology fellows, and urology fellows. Sorry. Uh, the MRIs were uh, reread by subspecialized uh, abdominal radiologists, and then if they were to proceed with a biopsy, received an 8 to 12 core system, uh, systematic biopsy uh, for any PIRADS lesion greater than 3. And a PIRADS lesion is basically a scoring system for how likely a, a uh, lesion is to be prostate cancer. Um, with PIRADS-3 lesions being sort of the, the go-to for beginning of clinically significant uh, prostate cancer. We analyzed the data and used Cohen-Kappa values to quantify any inter-observer uh, variability, uh, and positive predictive values were used to determine the accuracy of the PIRADS score for detecting uh, clinically significant prostate cancer in these patients who underwent biopsies. So of the 303 cases that we reviewed, um, 42 uh, MRIs had lesions downgraded from a PIRADS three or more uh, down to a PIRADS less than two or two or less. Uh, and 10 MRIs confirmed a negative, uh, negative result. Uh, so these patients were uh, not eligible for a biopsy. Of the 251 patients remaining, uh, there was 332 confirmed uh, PIRADS three or greater lesions. Um, 53 of these patients under, did not actually undergo uh, a fusion biopsy for various reasons. Uh, so that, less, that left us with 198 patients with 252 uh, confirmed lesions uh, that were biopsied. Um, 
This is just a general uh, data slide here for where the tumors were. Um, the the pyrads lesions uh, had an average size of 1.3 and uh, were kind of evenly split between the peripheral zone and the transition zone of the prostate. Um, the reads showed that there was roughly 45% uh, pyrads 3 lesions, 40% pyrads 4 lesions, and 15% uh, pyrads 5 lesions on the re-evaluation. So the 332 pyrads greater than three lesions uh, between the community and academic sites, 60.5% uh, uh, agreement between the, the radiologists, 7.8% um, uh, of the lesions were upgraded, 17.8% of the lesions were downgraded, and 13.9% uh, were discordant, uh, discordant reads. 36 of those um, were uh, those lesions were not detected on initial interpretation in the community. Uh, seven of those lesions had no PIRAD score initially provided on the report, um, and three had an entirely different lesion detected uh, on re-review. So with regards to the inter-observer agreement, this is the Cohen Kappa value uh, test where basically anything between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 is uh, moderate agreement and uh, anything less than 0.4 is fair agreement. Um, so overall, um, there was fair agreement between the community and uh, tertiary referral center um, radiologists and the PIRADS uh, four lesions seem to have uh, moderate agreement uh, compared to uh, the uh, community reads. Uh, interestingly, the peripheral zone uh, lesions tended to have a higher amount of agreement between the radiologists as compared to transition zone lesions. Um, the lesions that were biopsied, 45% uh, or so were benign pathology with 14% being uh, Gleason 3 plus 3 or non-clinically significant prostate cancers, and then the remainder were clinically significant. When we looked at the positive predictive values of the um, um, clinically significant prostate cancer compared between the tertiary center and community reads, uh, it seemed as though there was a pretty good agreement um, or uh, both both uh, reads had good positive predictive values uh, overall, and uh, but the transition zone lesions tend to have a bit a uh, bit of a discrepancy between the uh, pyrads four and pyrads five lesions between community and academic sites or, or tertiary sites, um, and uh, that just goes to the the uh, uh, complexity of the anatomy in those in those areas. So. Um, the effect on the clinical outcome, basically the decision to biopsy was changed in 55 patients with 49 not receiving biopsy after re-review, uh, either downgrading or, or negative uh, MRI. Uh, and 36 lesions were actually missed on the initial ter interpretation in the community, uh, of which 26 were biopsied, 10 having clinically significant prostate cancer, uh, and four with uh, low-grade disease. So there is variability existing in the community um, and uh, tertiary uh, care center interpretation of prostate MRI, which has uh, been seen in other, other uh, areas of medicine as well. Uh, overall, the concordance rates were improved for higher grade and peripheral zone lesions in the prostate. And tertiary center interpretation had higher positive predictive values for detecting clinically significant prostate cancer. Uh, this kind of highlights the need for ongoing education and quality assurance and feedback uh, within abdominal radiology as multiparametric prostate MRI uh, improves and becomes more accessible. And uh, it's actually been interesting the last year having uh, Zoom meetings and things. Uh, there may be a future role for including community radiologists and community urologists in the um, in the review of their cases to, to support or, or um, at least uh, learn about uh, why their patients are or are not going through for a uh, fusion MRI biopsy. Um, a few references and thanks for your time. Thanks guys. Um, so my name's Josh and I'm currently a medical student working with Dr. Peter Black. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank the faculty as well as my supervisor and Mathieu for helping me prepare for the presentation today. So like we mentioned, the presentation today will be discussing the long-term survival outcomes of low-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and we're trying to answer the question, how long is cystoscopic surveillance necessary? 
And so just a little bit of background, when we say low risk disease, we're specifically referring to the criteria that have been set by various guidelines. And for instance, the American Association has defined them as primary, solitary, low grade, non-invasive tumors under three centimeters across. What we know about the population is that despite the fact that they have a very high risk of recurrence, the risk of progression is comparatively low. But nonetheless, it's necessary to follow up through yearly cystoscopy, which is also recommended by the guidelines. However, when we think about follow up, it really is a balancing act between the, the pros of it, trying to reduce uh, the incidence of progression and whatnot, but also some of the cons, which can include prolonged discomfort for the patient and the economic burden, especially given that these patients often have pretty good outcomes and will end up coming in year after year after year for repeated cystoscopies. And so in an attempt to balance these factors, various guidelines have tried to find some kind of appropriate stopping ground to discontinue surveillance. The EAU has recommended five years, but more recently, the NIC in the UK has recommended something a little bit more radical at only one year of follow-up. And so there's clearly some level of disagreement with regards to this. And so the objective today is for us to report the risk of recurrence beyond five years after diagnosis and to try to identify some of the prognostic factors for late recurrence for low risk patients. So for this study, this was an international multi-centric retrospective observational study as a collaboration between our center here as well as the center in France, Toulouse, and some of our colleagues in Japan. Uh, patients were selected such that their initial diagnostic resection was before 2016 to provide adequate follow-up. And of course, these patients had to have low risk disease. And uh, on the patients, we collected information about their characteristics as well as information on their primary and any recurrent tumors, as well as information on the follow-up schedule. So what we see here, um, we just have a little bit of information about the overall population and we've highlighted some take home points so in total, there were 576 patients which were collected data on with a median age of 70 and a half years old. Approximately one fifth of the population was female. And one thing we wanted to bring your attention to was a certain proportion of these patients were actually rated as a G2 according to the 1973 guidelines of grading. And the reason for this is because when we selected these patients, they just needed to be low grade by the 2004 criteria. And a certain proportion of these patients will nonetheless be graded as G2 by the 1973 criteria. So that's just one thing to make note of. Um, in this population, we observed 236 recurrences, which was approximately 40% of the population. And in the patients who we noticed did recur, we found that on average, they were older, had less chemotherapy and had larger tumor sizes. And the, these factors were uh, in agreement with what was previously shown in the literature. So what we have here is a capillary curve of the overall population and the recurrences and the recurrence-free survival. And you'll just notice that we've actually broken it down into sort of three various timeline sections uh, from zero to 24 months, from 24 to 60 months and 60 months onwards. And the main reason we did this was because we actually observed a differential uh, risk of recurrence in each uh, time period. What you'll notice in the first two years was that a whopping 25% approximately of the patients recurred. It was then followed by from two to five years when only about 13% recurred. And then lastly, after five years, around 7% of the population recurred. And so in essence, what we can see here is that as time progressed, the level or the, uh, the risk of recurrence uh, progressively decreased as well. Uh, finally, one more thing that we observed was that in this population, approximately 5% of patients had a high risk recurrence in long-term follow-up. And when we say high risk, we refer specifically to a recurrence, which is either high grade T1 or carcinoma in situ. Here we're just showing four Kappa-Mayer curves, again, looking at recurrence-free survival and, and how they're associated with various factors. At the top two, we can see that uh, as a function of age and grade, these were not significant predictors of recurrence. However, at the bottom two, the use of post-operative chemotherapy and the tumor size were in fact uh, significant factors and predictive of recurrence. Uh, one more thing to notice here is that in the case of size, most notably is the two to three centimeter group, which had the, low, uh, the highest risk of recurrence and ultimately the lowest recurrence for survival. With those significant factors in mind, we then try to break up patients into various risk stratification groups 
in accordance to what we observed previously. And so what you'll see here is that in red, we had a group, which is patients who received chemotherapy and had tumors under two centimeters across. In green were patients who did not receive chemotherapy with tumors under two centimeters across. And lastly, in blue were patients who had tumors from two to three centimeters across, whether or not they received chemotherapy. And what we can see here is that breaking patients into these three risk, risk stratification groups, we are actually able to observe a significant difference in their recurrence-free survival based on the, the culmination of those factors. And so in conclusion, what we have, we've observed in our study today is that as we observe these patients over time, their risk of recurrence decreases progressively from two to five years and five years onwards and remains uh, comparatively low after five years. Some of the important prognostic factors which we found included the use of post-operative chemo and, and tumor size. And more importantly, we were able to show that breaking patients into various risk ratification groups based on these criteria can actually yield differences in uh, recurrence risk. And so what we propose in the future is we could trial differential surveillance timelines based on the group that patients fall under to potentially reduce the use of unnecessary um, systopic follow-up and ultimately reduce uh, patient discomfort and ultimately unnecessary economic burden on the healthcare system. And so with that in mind, thank you for listening and I can take some questions now. Hi everyone and many thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm conscious that we're quite a diverse group here and um, many may be unfamiliar with lipomyelomeningocele. So I just wanted to spend a little time just to um, outline what this is and the challenges of managing um, this condition. So uh, lipomyelomeningocele is a subtype of spina bifida um, where essentially you have a lipoma or a fatty growth that's attached to the spinal cord uh, through a defect in the vertebral column. Um, many of these um, children will be born with some cutaneous um, stigmata, such as a sacral pit or um, a palpable lipoma. Um, however, uh, the majority will be born um, um, without any neurological deficits. Um, as um, the child grows, some of these lipomas will limit um, axial growth of the spinal cord and a proportion will go on to develop some neurological signs um, such as uh, lower limb weakness, gait disturbance, bowel or bladder um, dysfunction. Um, and if um, these go untreated, um, they may develop more dramatic signs such as inward turning of the foot or a leg length uh, discrepancy. So the challenge is trying to identify um, which patients will go on to develop some neurological dysfunction and require surgical intervention. Um, in our spinal cord clinic, we perform urodynamic studies at a baseline of three to six months. And um, again, in patients who require neurosurgical intervention. Um, so we wondered if there might be an association between neurodynamic parameters and um, these children who go on to um, have a neurological deficit requiring intervention. And so with this in mind, um, we did a retrospective study of pediatric patients attending our clinic with lipomyelomeningoceles. We recorded baseline demographics, uh, the requirement for surgical intervention, bowel and bladder dysfunction, and um, the urodynamics parameters were evaluated using a previously validated composite score. Uh, the urodynamic score that we used was developed by a number of internationally renowned pediatric urologists who sought to create a quantitative uh, assessment of pediatric urodynamics. Uh, it consists of four domains, bladder capacity, compliance, detrusor activity, and bladder sensation. Um, in the case of our study, um, we omitted the bladder sensation domain because the majority of our patients um, would have been too young to comment on bladder sensation. So we identified 32 patients, 16 boys and 16 girls, and um, they had baseline neurodynamics at uh, six months with a follow-up of 11 years. Uh, 17 patients required a detethering procedure. Um, this um, was um, most commonly indicated by um, neurological deterioration, such as muscle weakness or an interning of the foot. Uh, and notably, it was not dictated by your dynamics findings because, of course, these were just arranged as part of a preoperative workup. 
Um, surgery was performed at a median of 27 months, and it was not associated with sex or the age at baseline neurodynamics. So within our total cohort, seven patients manage um, with clean catheterization, five in the surgical group and two in the non-surgical group, and the main remainder avoid normally. Uh, four patients require regular laxatives, that's three in the surgical group and one in the non-surgical group. The remainder are not on a specific bowel management program. In terms of the urodynamics parameters themselves, there was no difference in baseline urodynamics scores in patients who required surgery versus those who did not. Um, the median uh, score in the surgical group was eight, the non-surgical group was 10. And there was, however, a significant deterioration in neurodynamic scores from baseline in patients who required intervention. And they went from a baseline score of eight to a median pre-surgical score of 5.6. These scores did, however, improve following surgical detethering and went from a median score of 5.6 to a median score of 10. And so this is an exploratory study and it has all the limitations of that. However, it did lead to a number of interesting conclusions. Um, baseline neurodynamic parameters were unable to predict which patients required surgical intervention, but that's not um, unsurprising when we consider that the majority of these patients have no neurological deficits at birth. Um, patients who required detethering had a significant deterioration in preoperative neurodynamic parameters, and this suggests that um, this uh, composite score might be used as a tool um, for risk stratification and outcome monitoring of these patients. Uh, it also begs the question whether we should be performing routine neurodynamics in this cohort um, in an effort to detect changes which might precede other neurological findings, um, bearing in mind the earlier we can intervene in symptomatic patients, the better. Um, to our knowledge, this is the first study um, to look at neurodynamic parameters in this cohort. However, we have reached out to our colleagues south of the border who may perhaps be more liberal in um, performing these kind of investigations to see if there is some routine or, or interval neurodynamic data available that we might be able to analyze um, uh, traditionally in our spinal cord clinic, we don't perform routine neurodynamics uh, for a number of reasons, and not least because this, um, these patients are sensate and we want to try and uh, limit the amount of uh, discomfort from repeated neurodynamics um, uh, uh, studies. So I apologize for the technology uh, issues, but I'll now take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Harriman. Um, thanks a lot, everyone, for having me. I'm excited to uh, talk about our study, the baseline frailty and physical functioning status of kidney transplant recipients, uh, need for prehabilitation. And as Dr. Harriman mentioned, I'm a third year medical student at UBC uh, in the Northern program in Prince George. So a little background, um, end stage renal disease ultimately results in the need for renal replacement therapy, either in the form of kidney transplantation or dialysis with kidney transplant being the gold standard. Um, however, there are many factors that must be considered when assessing the eligibility of transplant recipients. And numerous studies have shown that frail kidney transplant recipients are at a much increased risk of adverse post-transplant outcomes, in, um, including increased length of stay, increased graft function, early hospital readmission, increased mortality. With regards to frailty, it's often a term used by clinicians. However, it's often has an unclear definition and does not often involve any physical functioning metrics. So what is frailty? Well, frailty is a clinically recognizable state of physiological decline across many domains, including health, mobility, function, and cognition. With regards to surgery in particular, there's kind of been a recent trend in looking at frailty as a potential modifiable patient characteristic in surgical practice. So in one study looking at 430,000 um, surgical patients, frailty was associated with increased all-cause mortality at 30, 90, and 100 days across all levels of surgical stress. And this was looking at multiple different surgical disciplines. Uh, another study looking at 35,000 general surgery cases showed that there was increasing frailty, uh, was associated with increased wound infection, wound occurrence, and any type of infection post-op. And frailty is often normally considered um, mostly in the elderly. However, multiple studies have shown that even after adjustment for age and comorbidity, 
frailty is associated with increased 30 day mortality, post operative complications, and prolonged length of stay. So, this creates kind of a dilemma and a potential um, ability for, to look at frailty as a modifiable patient characteristic in surgical practice. However, there are currently no guidelines to objectively assess the frailty and physical functioning status of transplant candidates. So the aim of our current study was to objectively quantify the prevalence of frailty amongst candidates in BC, and secondly, to quantify the frailty status and its relationship to physical functioning at the time of assessment. So our study looked at 86 uh, transplant candidates at BGH between August 2019 and April 2021. Inclusion criteria was greater than 19 years old, um, either assessed by Dr. Guan or Dr. Harriman to be waitlisted for kidney transplant, and then the ability to physically participate in all the functional outcome measures. So we looked at frailty, physical function, and fatigue, which were measured at the time of assessment. With regards to frailty, we used the fried frailty phenotype, which, is, which has been the most validated measure of frailty in end-stage renal disease patients. Uh, this assessment has three subjective questions, and then there are two objective measures, which include uh, weakness measured with grip strength and slowed walking speed with a timed up and go test. With regards to frailty, this, it's scored between zero and five, with zero and, zero and one being not frail, two being intermediately frail, and three or more being frail. With regards to physical functioning, uh, we use the six minute walk test and 30 seconds sit to stand, which have been most validated in cardiac and uh, pulmonary conditions, which have shown to be a good surrogate for aerobic capacity as well as functional strength and endurance. Comparisons between frailty status and physical functioning were made using uh, one-way ANOVA and then post hoc tests to determine the difference between the various groups. So this just shows the demographic data. We had a total of 86 uh, consented and of that 80 participants completed all components of the physical functioning and frailty assessment. So the mean age was 56.5 and there was no statistical difference between age or BMI amongst the three groups that we looked at. Breaking it down further, um, with regards to the 80 participants, 42% were considered not frail, while 21.3% were considered frail. With respect to dialysis status, 53% of these, in, of these individuals were on hemodialysis, while 23% uh, were still on pre-dialysis. And breaking this down further, although it is a smaller sample size, we can see that of the frail group, 70% um, of these were um, on hemodialysis showing that there is, is kind of a, a need to target this. With regards to physical functioning measures, um, we saw that there was a significant difference between the not frail and frail groups with respects to the distance covered in the six minute walk test, as well as the number of repetitions completed in the 30 seconds sit to stand. And continuing along this line, there was also a significant difference between the not frail group and frail group in the fatigue score, as well as the timed up and go test, which involves walking uh, three meters and turning, turning back and sitting down. That's part of the fried frailty assessment. So the results from our preliminary data show that frailty is highly prevalent in BC patients who are being considered for kidney transplant. And there's also a significant decrease in physical functioning associated with prog progression of frailty status which highlights the potential utility of prehabilitation as a means to improve physical functioning and slow the progression of frailty preoperatively. So where do we go from here? Well, the future of prehab in kidney transplant um, is based on these current findings. We've proposed a new trial that will incorporate a home-based exercise program prior to kidney transplant. And we hypothesize that a prehabilitation program will result, will result in improved physical functioning preoperatively and slow the progression of frailty. We also hypothesize that prehabilitation will result in improved kidney transplant outcomes post-operatively. Our trial um, involves a six-week take-home exercise program prior to kidney transplant. Um, the duration of this exercise program is based on the current literature and prehab, 
um, mostly in cardiac and cancer populations. And furthermore, our exercise intervention will involve uh, aerobic resistance and flexibility exercises, again, based on the current literature and prehab. Uh, however, we hope that with some more funding and support, we'll be able to actually tailor these exercise programs to, a, to the specific patient in order to optimize um, their ability preoperatively. So yeah, uh, thank you everyone for listening. You can check out our virtual platform at fitkinney.ca. And I have to give a big shout out to Annie and Katie who have been the backbone of the study with regards to patient recruitment and assessment uh, while I'm trying to finish clerkship. So yeah, thank you.